how y'all doing? This is Joshua Crawford again. I'm here checking out this new R&B artist right here, my friend, Mr. Michael Knowles. Hey, Michael Knowles, shout out. Shout out, man. Shout hey, out. Yeah, yeah. We we <laughs> known each other for a long time, guys. I mean, before all this thing happened, man. We five were, years. Like, yeah, five years. We were like at a, at a college. We were working on plays and shows and stuff like that. And this guy right here, he was like open-minded person. He kept up with everybody. I mean, he's a most talented guy. I mean. Anything you think he can do, he can do. I mean, this guy can really blow, like, sing. Give a little harmony, a little verse, something like that. Give him, like, a little blast. Give him a little something like that. See? <laughs> <laughs> you see my point? Yeah, he can harmonize and stuff like that. He can trust me. That's just a little tip. But trust me, he can really sing his songs and stuff like that. He's really good. So let me over here. Here, I'm just going to interview my boy right here. So I know y'all got a lot of questions to ask this guy. So I'm going to be here to ask the questions for you. So one of the questions was, they like to know. They like to know more about yourself. So you mind telling the viewers about more about yourself? Well, uh, I was born here in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, uh, Collie Park. Uh, college Park, <laughs> but um, I moved to uh, Stone Mountain when I was like five, six. But uh, all my life, I've been introduced to music, and uh, music has always been in my presence. So um, every time I wake up, I always sing. But throughout my life, I had some struggling because I, because I used to be big, like three hundred pounds. So it always came up about my weight. Like, you gotta be this size, you gotta be that size. So, I was big all the way up until my junior year in college. So, I wanted new roles for plays. I wanted the, I wanted the lead roles. And uh, I wanted to pursue my music career because nowadays, there's a certain look you have to have in order to be recognized. You can't just have the voice. You gotta have the look to go with it for some parts of the music industry. So I lost over 145 pounds. Yeah, that's a great, because I remember him. He used to be a chubby guy, but trust me, even <laughs> though he was chubby, he was still love. He was a good teddy bear. I mean, the girls used to call him teddy bear all the time because he was like to be hugged yeah. and everything. So he was a, yeah, trust me, he was a charmer back then. So don't let the weight thing get to you. I mean, don't let it get to anyone. It's all about the charm, guys. It's all about charm, yeah. So tell me, uh, Mike, what got you into acting? Acting... Throughout my life, I've been going through self-esteem issues, like uh, about me being big again, but I figured that being an actor was like the portal of being free, of being like another person. And sometimes when I get in too in debt with my character, I can actually play that actual character in real life. So that's the thing about acting. You have to find that, that moment when you reach your climax of the character that you are playing and it kind of collides that this is you. And sometimes, like with me, I've done certain plays where I actually had to play a sorrowful person, someone who's in pain, someone who has been hurt, and it related to what I was going through in real life so I actually have my breakthroughs on stage. So when we do curtain call, I feel free. So it's really, it's really phenomenal that acting can really make you lose yourself within the atmosphere of the stage. Because to me, stage, the stage is my home. And by being around people who actually have the same love for acting as me, being around powerful actors, because powerful acting, you have to bounce off of each other. Because if, if, if you shoot out a line with much power, the same, uh, like the actor that you're acting with gotta shoot it back to you. It's like, it's energy and it's tiring. It's like, if you're not tired after a show, then you haven't really done your job. If you're not out of breath or you're not really feeling the drainage of an actual show, because me and my boy Josh, we've done shows yeah. that were almost 
four hours long. Oh yeah, I, re- I remember that. It was uh, August Wilson's Jitney. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was tough because it was like my first time getting back on the stage after mm-hmm. a long time. Because I used to do a lot of acting with my brother Jeremy. We did a, 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 a Shakespearean play, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and I played his butler, Philostrate, while uh, he was thesis. Yeah, I was pumped. <laughs> yeah, 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 man. I tell you, one time I did something stupid, man. One time I was waiting because the scene was very long. I mean, I only had two parts to show up, one beginning, one end. I was just sitting there in the backstage just looking at my watch, waiting for the time. Man, one day, they, one day I did something really stupid. I walked out of there with my watch on. In Greek time, and That's everybody. What I had no watch oh, I, Greek I said time. Greek watch. I had to put my hand like this so fast, man. I was, I was. Everybody looking at me like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I had my hand behind my back the whole time. The director looking at me like, boy. <laughs> oh, the director. But he, it was funny because people thought it was funny. They actually laughed to it. It didn't mess up the show at all. It was like, man, that was just like funny because it's a comedy play. It's like even though Shakespeare's all about sex, even though that's most of his plays about, but that's mostly like a comedy thing. So that kind of actually set the tone right there. But I was embarrassed, man. But that's what really, really made me focus on staying on time. But he is right about one thing. You have to put all your energy out there in acting because if you don't, you just a waste of time. You really haven't done anything. See, it's not just about acting. It's about ad-libbing the moment, being that person, actually seeing that character as if it was your life, as if you were actually living that kind of lifestyle. It's not easy concept to do. It takes a lot of practice, takes a lot of research, takes a lot of rehearsal. Because Mike over here, he did a lot of rehearsal when he played Becker because a lot of people thought when he play that part back in August Wilson's Jitney, they thought he was actually an old man. They didn't realize he was a young man. So he really took the time to understand the, the movement, posture, and everything that what it takes to be an elderly man. Everybody. Oh, yeah, everybody, everybody. Everybody had to be old. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. We had to grow out our beards. Oh, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Especially, uh, uh, what was the guy who played uh, Turnbow? What was his name? Um, we call him Howling Wolf. Yeah, Howling Wolf. Yeah, Howling yeah. Wolf. That man was the killer of the whole show. I mean, he made me laugh. I almost broke my line a couple of times. The way he, cool. he had an accent that really flowed. I mean, he was like the talk of the show. Yeah. I mean, every time people just hear him speak, they just want to laugh. I mean, they just... like, who, pizza? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this man was a hoot right there. I really enjoyed working with him. But now he's just serving the Army. He's, mm-hmm. heard he's serving the Army now, yeah. which is a great thing. I think he will serve our country very well. He might actually laugh at our enemies and definitely join forces. Like, you know, why don't we just do like Ronnie King? Why don't we just all just get along? Come on, man. Let's no more fighting, no more violence. Come on, let's just sit down here, have ourselves some gin, just sit down here, talk about our problems like men. Just stop just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, gin, like stuff like that. Hey, hey, a lot of people like gin. Who don't like gin? Uh, it was a bad experience, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but oh, yeah. um, but anyway, it's like the actual foundation of the theatrical world is always the first show. Mm-hmm. The first show is like the seller. You have to sell the show on the first on the opening night. So that's like advertising for the people who haven't seen it yet can come out for the second and third and fourth show. So for because basically for a show, it's usually four nights. All nights. Four days. And the sellers is always the opening night and the finale. You have to begin strong and you have to end it strong. Like the right. second and third show kind of lacks energy because we, we got the hang of it and we just want to go home. Yeah. Even though there's only like four to ten people in the audience, we still have to make sure that it yeah. was like the opening night. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's just only yeah. three people or one. It's if it's just one audience, person there, they deserve. Audience. Yeah, because you never know that yeah. one person audience might be a big that time producer, a, a big producer. time producer who just like just sat there just who just, a, see. Who yeah. just reserved who, the whole audience. Exactly, the, the you never know. Yeah, you never himself. know who you're gonna bump into when you're doing shows like that. Just treat it like it was like a big time impact show. Just do it like that. I don't care if it's small or decent. Just one person. Just do it. It's all about having the love for it. You got to have the love for it. You got to have yeah. the passion for it. If you have no passion for acting, then don't try it. Because, see, you got to go what you love to do. Not just something you feel obligated. Not just that. It doesn't work like Which that. Which leads man. to this. It's yeah. like when you love something, yeah. even though you have a raw talent for it, it has to be trained. That's what my professors at Savannah State taught me. Um, my professor, uh, Teresa Walker, and Dr. David I.L. Poole, and Daryl Thompson, 
and, and Heidi Benhammer. Yeah, we love them very yes, much. I mean, we I appreciate yes. all the stuff they taught me. It's really David Ayapu. I mean, I you ain't going to see no other person that can design sets like he can do. I mean, I was impressed Man. how he did Frankenstein, especially that scene where they did the, uh, the ice. Scene. Yeah, the hanging scene. That, that, that really scared me to death. I mean, I, I still remember people's reaction to it. They thought actually Cree, who played that character, uh, what was that character's name, uh, who was accused of killing that boy? What was it? Uh, she was the nurse. Yeah, the nurse. Yeah, the yeah. nurse. Yeah, the nurse. Yeah. So they accuse her, and then they hanged her. But the way they did it was they actually showed the hanging. They pushed her off, and she was like dangling back and forth. And we thought it was Cree, but it wasn't. It looked like it was a dummy, but it looked like Cree. I'm like, I, it was amazing. I mean, I like how he did the whole scene right there. That's still one of my favorite moments of his work. That really right there, that scene. Right yeah, there. but uh, he did a good job uh, for. Um Frankenstein, and I was a part of the collective face yeah. theater ensemble in the city of Savannah. I really do miss y'all. I miss y'all so much. But um, he did wonderful plays like No Exit, Equus, um, Salome, Into the Woods. Into the Woods was fun. Oh, it, yes. it, it was very fun. Yeah, it it was, was very vibrant. But all in all, uh, if you have a raw talent, it needs to be trained, but don't have it to a certain point where you're obligated to do your talent. Mm -hmm. It's like, have fun while you're training. Like, have fun while you're training to make your craft greater. You know, like, because it's like we can be in class all day yep. knowing that we have a show mm -hmm. yes, that's, that's, that's going to that's be four hours long, but all of us felt that would be our relaxed time. Of course, we had to put on makeup and costumes. We had our lines already memorized and all yeah. that, so we were good. <laughs> yeah, it was. But being on stage and actually seeing reactions from the audience, it actually made us more energetic yeah. to make the lines much more greater, especially the dramatic scenes. Oh, well, yeah, they were some dramatic Cause, cause, scenes. Because when you go in depth with your character and you got the audience backing mm -hmm. you up, it makes you want to do more. Like that yeah. time, I like in Jitney, I felt it and I threw the frame. Oh yeah, even everybody. though I wasn't supposed to throw it, <laughs> but I felt yeah. like I had to throw the frame. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> even our directors was like on pause. They didn't expect that to happen. Like, they were like blown away. Like, like, I think they were like a little skeptical. <laughs> like, I hope they didn't destroy our prop. Please don't destroy our prop. I mean, we don't feel like getting another one. But they were. They actually it flowed. I mean, see. Never it know. Flowed with their yeah, yeah. You're never. You, you, <laughs> the thing about acting is you got to do things a little differently how the director tells you to do it because mm -hmm. the directors want to have a way of seeing things. But sometimes the actors can actually evolve the way the director's thinking and stuff like yeah. that. And that's why one of the scenes right there because it is an ablation. It's called ablation. You got to improv. You got improving is something that most actors need to master because once you learn how to improv and master it, at the point even though you stumble on something. You mm -hmm. could actually ad lib into the part to get you back on track, but at the same time keeping that character. It's all about ad lib, and you gotta practice that. That's the key yeah. in acting. You gotta ad lib and stuff. So, like he's saying, like it takes time, it takes patience. But trust me, if you practice and you put your heart into it, trust me, anything's possible. I'm gonna tell you, it is. Also, I just something I want to talk about is his album, uh, Mike. Oh, it's Odyssey. Yeah, Odyssey. yeah, Odyssey. I checked out his album, man. It's really great, man. I look at all the songs, man. It's like turning going back to R&B back in the '90s. It's really Really hard for them. I mean, you can actually feel the vibe. You can actually feel the the, the thanks, form. man. Yeah, yeah. I'm you, I, I don't say it's a lot. Look, I don't really don't say it's a lot, Mike. I really don't. Because I've I seen a lot of people show me demos of their songs, stuff mm -hmm. like that. I know they're trying, but they just haven't got the element yet. They just haven't found their vibe. They just going mechanical. They just not just taking the time to understand the value of music and what's going on in today's side. But for you, other hand, I saw your album. You're pretty much affecting me. I mean, I mean, it's got me thinking back in the past how things were. I mean, how music should be. I mean, that's how it is. So tell me, who are the people who helped you with this company? Who was it? You know? Oh, I'm part of a uh, company called uh, Schizo Productions. Oh, schizo. And, um, and I'm part of MVP mm. uh, Productions now um, under uh, Todd, Todd Hartley. Um, <laughs> it's in Atlanta. But the thing about my first album, it was kind of like my my starting point like I knew there was some little glitches here and there um, with um, with the songs but that was kind of like my trial run to make sure that I have that I had the potential to actually do an album and people actually liked it and I was very shocked about it so I was like well I wanted to do a plethora of different genres which tells a story 
Like Odyssey, I start from the beginning that I lead up to all the way being happy. Like in the like the first song, I was sad. Mm-hmm. But every t- but every song, I got happier and happier to my final. Yeah, yeah. Song I, called yeah. Turn Up. Oh yeah, this you know. Is, so yeah, <laughs> turned up. Yeah, that's a song right there. Right, that's something like you most likely teenagers would do to try to have fun at a house party where their yeah. parents are out of town and stuff like that. And I kind of felt that it's kind of when I heard that song turned up. It found me of a house party. That's what reminded me of that element when they were all having fun, just being mm-hmm. themselves, just yeah. having a good time and stuff like that. But my all-time favorite of all your songs is "Come As You Are." Yeah. Come as you are, because that song is a signature thing about teaching young African women that you don't have to wear all these weeds, all these makeup, and, and try to make yourself look different than what you got made you who you are. It's a song that pretty much just accept yourself who you are, be happy, and be and you're beautiful the way you look. You, just, you ain't gotta like impress nobody and stuff like that. As long as you think you're beautiful and you go by it, it doesn't matter what else people say. That's what I felt with that vibe of your song right there. Mm-hmm. And a body's call, it kind of remind me of. Uh, I know people gonna get on me with this one. It kind of remind me of D'Angelo's song. How does it feel? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really does. Because you can actually hear you can hear the tone and voice from it. And also another vibe from uh, R. Kelly's song, "A Body's A Body's Call." You know, it's not a, it's not a copyright fragment. No, 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 no. It's different. Trust me. If you listen to bass and his, it's totally different, different stuff. So that's what another thing I felt like R. Kelly felt. That's what I kind of feel he getting with that that version. It's pretty much reinventing it and turning yeah. it into something else. It's like, you can hear a man actually aching for a good woman. It's not just like him lusting for it. He's actually asking for a I good woman. I need a woman. woman. Yeah, you need a woman. Yeah, we all need a woman, but look, don't rush getting a woman yet until you get yourself together, guys. I'm telling you. you your goal is to make, impress them. It's to, it's yeah. to impress them. Trust me. I know the old saying where they, we try to have them come to us now. You do, you, you, you build yourself up first and you get yourself together, I guarantee they'll come to you. And then you can prove themselves to them. And that's how it works, guys. See, you got to use your own self to make yourself better. You got to. Otherwise, it's a waste, man. Because trust me, man, we don't want to be another uh, statistic of black men not doing what they're supposed to do, ending up blending their families and getting another one knocked up over and over <laughs> again. Because you, you, you got to remind me of that uh, Oprah special where this one dude knocked out. Wow, what are you, 20, 25 women and had <laughs> had over about 36 kids. He, I mean, I said he sat there right there. No, it wasn't 20 women. It was like 15 to 16 women knocked up, and each one had at least about two kids by this brother. And I don't know about that dude, but... That's a big family. I, no, 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 ain't, no, no, no. That's, that's, uh, that's what I call a hell of an amount of child support. I mean, if you won the lottery right now, all that money would be gone. All that money will be divided by his, by his, by his, by his girlfriends and his kids, to it and everything. All that he won't have a penny less. That's a, like a, that's a death sentence. I'd rather take prison. And I don't know what, but, but I tell you one thing, guys. One thing that guy did teach us protection. You always use protection, no matter what. Use protection because I mean, you never know. It only takes five seconds. Five seconds. That's all it is. That's all it is. So, but I know we all trapped, but let's get back to my friend Mike. I know he got a lot to talk about. I heard you saw some of these pictures that he posted of himself modeling and stuff like that. I know some people were feeling some great. I'd like to talk more about it. So, Mike, tell us some more about the modeling stuff. It's freedom. It's it's a lot of freedom. Um, yeah. I, made sh- I make sure that they are tastefully done. You know what I'm saying? So, I'm not offending nobody. Some people may come at me saying, like, why did you do that? And I'm like, well, you took the time to see it, so you must under, un, like, down low, you, you, you like the, the photo. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like, by being big all my life and been able, because I didn't know I was going to be a model. You know what I mean? So when I actually lost the weight and people actually looked at me saying, like, you could do modeling. I'm like, really? So I did my first photo shoot three years ago, and the photographer said, you are a natural, but you need training, you know? So years progressed. I did more photo shoots. I did more photo shoots. People noticed. Um, I'm on Model Mayhem, uh, Model Mike Knowles. So you can check out some of my pictures there. And I actually like to share my pictures on Facebook and Instagram. My Instagram is Mike19635. So you can see some of my photos on there. And my Facebook is just Michael Knowles. 
but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can I can relate to it because I when I was young I was shy about being a model. People say Josh, there's something about you that that's model material. So when I got older and started getting myself in shape, a lot of people kept asking me to check out models. So what I did was my father, he's a professional photographer. He kind of did some test shots with me, and so far he he says I got it, but I still like Mike. I gotta train. It's all about it's not about looking good and about getting yourself in better shape. It's about yeah. posture. You got to feel it. You got to live it, and you got to embrace it. It's no different from acting. You got to embrace the moment. So act modeling is just like acting. You got to feel it. You got to understand it. You got to be that person, even though it's off that person and stuff like that. So that's another thing. Yeah. So. But in one thing, though, uh, location photo shoots are the are basically key. the and best. I, I can key. Can I, I'm a person who's talking myself. Location is key. And background, everything says it and everything. So if you think you got great spot, model shots of yourself, you got to show it to professionals. And professionals will tell you the truth. Even if it hurts your feelings, they will tell you what works, what don't work, and what needs improvement and everything. And the thing about the entertainment business, modeling, music... Or etc. You need to have tough skin. Oh Instructive yes. Instructive criticism is a key factor in the music and the modeling bi- yeah. and the entertainment business as a whole. As a general, you gotta have tough skin because mm-hmm. there will be people out there who will criticize you. Mm-hmm. Tough. Oh yeah. They will. They will tear you down. But deep down, they're trying to help you. Exactly. Take it to the head, not the heart. Because mm-hmm. sometimes people look at you and say you have potential, but some people just don't accept the criticism, so they turn to anger. Yep, and that's and then, what... And then you're just blackballed. Like, you can be at an audition, and the director can give you some criticism, and then you bark back at them saying that, well, I think I did a good job. That director may have connections because they, mm-hmm. because they already have your head shot. And everything they mm-hmm. can give that head shot to all the other directors in in your area and tell them don't cast this person you're right you know what I'm saying mm-hmm. so you have to be cordial respectful and, exactly. and, and be able to accept it. like what you need to do to make your craft better exactly you know? that's that's and, a... and who knows they might have you on standby for future plays exactly or, or films it's like you may not have it's like you may not have had the, the look for that particular play, but there was something in you that they saw, like, okay, we'll use him for the other yeah. project we're working yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and sometimes you have to accept it. Like, you're not meant for every role. You don't have, it's like you're not, sometimes you can't fit every role that you audition for. Mm-hmm. You know, and you got to accept that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, it's like, we, we've auditioned for years at Savannah State, yeah. and... There were yeah. certain roles that I wanted, that we wanted, and we yeah. didn't get it. But we had to accept just being part of the ensemble. Mm-hmm. But you know what? The ensemble was was kind of like the best part of the play, really. Oh, yeah. Trust me. Look, look, you I, I tell folks, look, you're not ever going to start on top. Because I, yeah. I know how media and TV shows are so easy to get and everything. If that was the case, don't you think everybody would be rich right now? Everybody wouldn't be poor? We'd all be living in a big mansion? Or like, it doesn't work like that. I'd be See, in London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be in America. I would be somewhere out on the coast. I'd be the coast. I'd be in London. I'd be Puerto Rico. I'd be going to uh, the Caribbean because I, <laughs> I, I, I tell you, right there, you got to tell you, so that's like great freedom and atmosphere. You ain't got to do nobody bothering you. You just got free space. Either I mean, London yeah. or Bahamas. Oh, yeah. Bahamas. Bahamas. Uh, uh, Miami, Bahamas is my home. Miami. Miami is my home. I'm like Will Smith. Miami is my second home right there because trust me, you just yeah, like. Yeah, I forgot about Miami. Miami. Yeah. Yeah, you can't forget my, Miami. My, no, my no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In know. the Bahamas as well, so yeah, I got yeah, like yeah. homes. Well, your family's well. in Miami. You gotta be careful because you might catch you one day sitting on the tent. Like, what you doing with that little dong on with that little girl? What the girl get you? <laughs> yeah, you gotta be careful with stuff like that. But see, me personally, me, I just like look. I'm gonna tell you up front, me, me. I'm a beginning actor. I'm learning. I'm taking my time. I'm, no, you're not. Uh, I love, yeah, look, 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 look. We all begin. You've had actors. years. Yeah, we all had. Look, yeah, we all we're had years, years in now. Yeah, yeah we're years <laughs> into it. But the thing is, we still. But the thing is, we still at square one. We still working on trying to get our stuff noticed. You see, the thing is, you just gotta increase your opportunities. It's like my dad always said: increase your opportunity, limit your mistakes. If you know all the mistakes you've done in the past in acting and every stuff, you do what you can to diminish it. If you have a problem with taking criticism, first thing you gotta do is learn to take it, have tough skin. First thing, the best way to go is ask your family. Ask your family to tell you the truth. The family will never sugarcoat it. They will tell you the truth. 
My dad always tells me the truth. He says, son, I know what you're trying to do, but look, you got to do better. It's not going to work. Trust me. You got to try things a different way. You got to try a new different step. You got to do a different approach. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. So you got to take everything that can come to you. Because trust me, they're not there, like Mike said, they're not there to hurt you. No. They're there yeah. to embrace you and improve you. Because they see potential in you, but it's up to you to see the potential in yourself so you take that advice. Because if you don't, you're gonna always gonna be at square one and you're always gonna struggle. Because trust me, they're all struggling musicians, they're all struggling artists, they're all struggling everybody in entertainment. I know entertainment is getting so wild, big, not here at the ATL, because everything's building up, everyone wants to do it. But the thing yeah. is, you got to have, you got to get potential, you got to take criticism, you got to. You got to, that's the only way you can improve. Otherwise, if people told you truth all the time, that means you never gonna improve. You got to learn to take it. Because not everybody's going to like your work. Not everybody's going to appreciate what you're doing. Everybody's not going not, not to like you. That's the bottom line. We live in a world where everybody's going to judge you, no matter what. You can be the best entertainer in your world. You can be the best hit. You can be the best artist. You can get best everything. But people are always going to talk about you, no matter what. So you got to learn to take it. Otherwise, don't try it. Otherwise, you're going to end up self getting somebody hurt, which is yourself, and you must push you more pressure. Preach. Yeah, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I see a lot, man. I see a lot. Of my friends and co ops who I used to associate with, on way under that pressure, couldn't take it and commit suicide. I'm telling you, I, I can tell you stories about that because all because they didn't have tough skin, they never learned to take criticism and learn how to take it. I mean, seriously, it's a serious thing that most people gotta understand. Not everybody's gonna like your stuff, you just got to learn to take it. Me, yeah. I got criticized a lot of players by the sea, I really did about my work schedule, how my how I was a photographer as an actor. Yeah, it made me mad, but still, I just took it. I learned from it, and I pretty much embraced it so I can use it and take a look at myself and we'll see what I can do to do better. And I kind of thank you for this day because I, I got better. And I learned to see things how they were talking about and learned to try some things they were requesting, and I see how it can work for me. So it's best to take things greatly. But like Michael there, I know he's going to be a big-time musician. He really is. He's going to be a big artist. I know he's going to be R.B. charts. I know he's going to make it to the Grammys, and I know he's going to make it to the Oscars. I can see potential in him. I really do. I really, I really do. I see it. I see it in him. Thanks, bro. Yeah, I really but do. But every time you want to pursue your craft, have fun with it, it needs to be trained. Yeah. If you have a raw talent for it, it needs to be trained because the, the directors or anybody who's doing auditions, they want to see what's so special about you what can you do to make them feel like I'm the one for this part you know what I'm saying so but honestly before I get out of here always be humble always be humble because you never know like you can get up to like level three thinking you all that something will happen it will boost you down to level zero you know general note mm -hmm. for a general note because we are very humble mm -hmm. and we have done a lot of plays and film productions already you know um, you can check us out but be humble while you're doing your craft because there will always be someone out there who might be at your level so every like everything that you're good at there's always that one person that will always be your match and it's competitive it is. It's fun because you kind of know you're going to win. Well, yeah, you know what I mean? I like, I like but, competition. But anyway, um, I got to be out, but always be humble, bro. All, All right, right, man. Let's take it out. All, All right, right, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.